because Monero is really a, a privacy first currency, I think the ability to, to secure it with, with CPUs right now is great in terms of having a cur like a go-to currency that you know that you can, you can secure uh, with cheap hardware. So I think in terms of like, on if you're thinking like on a grassroots level of things, I think that's a really important decision to make. So I wanted to just throw out a, like that I do see some benefit. I wanted to highlight a, poten a potential benefit of choosing that route. Making it more uh, like accessible, you're saying more. Prepared. Yeah, yeah. And if you're if you're really trying to work under the radar, I think that you do want a currency that works in that way. But it does. But again, like you do, there is a trade off to that. Mm -hmm. So, I, but it's a, but it's, it's an important choice to make in that sense, because you're deciding that this is the route that you want. To this week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN a privacy-focused, audited, and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. CakeWallet and iVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you, and supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your CakeWallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Margot Paez, a.k.a. Jin Urso. Margo is a fellow at the Bitcoin Policy Institute specializing in renewable energy. She is also known for explaining why progressives should be embracing Bitcoin. In this chat, Doug and Margo don't focus only on those topics. Rather, the two start with a chat about her view of crypto from a physics perspective, which leads to much more, inevitably including her opinion of Monero. Monero Talk starts now. Margo, what's going on? Hey, thank you for having me. Now, do you go by Douglas or Doug? I, I'm not too familiar with your show, unfortunately. So Either one, either one. Uh, All right, well, hi, Douglas or Doug. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I just, I kind of, I've seen you, like, tweet on Twitter, you know, doing some, uh, getting into some deep stuff there, and then I started listening to you on Twitter. Oh, cool. <laughs> Somebody listening to me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, this, you're, you're very interesting. You seem to have a very uh, deep understanding of, of cryptocurrency. And I believe you have a, you have a fit, strong physics background, right? Yeah, actually. So I have a master's in physics, but my PhD was originally in physics and robotics. So at the intersection of physics and robotics. And then I, I got more concerned about climate change and, and wanted to put, do more about it. So I switched departments and took the master's but i actually i went through the whole process of getting to the point of like actually doing thesis research in, in physics so it's it's a little bit more than a master's but yeah so i do i do have a background <laughs> and um so so we'll, we'll just get right into it because i'm very interested in that and how that's kind of shaped your view on crypto oh, um, sure. from, from a physics perspective like what's your your take Nobody's on asked me that before. Well, like, we hear Michael Saylor talk about it in those terms. Uh, uh, yes. I'm curious if you if you have uh, either similar um, yeah. <laughs> there or maybe maybe something else or maybe not at all. Yeah. Well, mm, I have a slightly different take from Michael Saylor, so I don't know if you have a specific question or if you. Or if you uh, just if you want me to rant now, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your, where, where do you see crypto? I mean, do you see it potentially as as being uh, you know a kind of a breakthrough on a, on a fundamental level where for you know the first time in existence we're you know we're we're using energy to to sort and store data in a way where it becomes incorruptible. Over right. Yeah. Well, you know, Michael Saylor likes to. Say Bitcoin is digital energy, and I, I wholeheartedly disagree. I, and I, I would, I wanted you to explain that to me. <laughs> I also disagree with anyone who says Bitcoin is a battery. I mean, I'm not the only one. Like uh, my other physics friends, and who are physics graduate students, or 
far along in their PhD, we, we generally have many jokes around this because it's just, it's, it's just so, so wrong. I mean, what is, first of all, what's digital energy, right? Digital definitely means zeros and but, ones. There we go. So yeah. So my next point was, is that, you know, he said, he basically is like, yeah, you know, this is like energy to money and this is, you know, potential energy, it's digital energy. And like, like I said, there, there's no such thing as digital energy from a physics perspective. And, and while it's true that you can go from power to something else, this is also not unique to Bitcoin or any other proof of work cryptocurrency. This is something that happens all the time in the power sector. You can go from, you can go from power to aluminum. You can go from power to any, anything else that you can think of. Some like, you know, to hydrogen. You can go from power to any other type of data, data center operation where you're doing computations. This, it's not unique. So Bitcoin isn't special in this way. No other proof of where cryptocurrency is special in this way. This is just a pretty standard thing that happens. And it's so in, in that sense, I don't think it's an innovation. There are unique properties of proof of work mining, Bitcoin mining in particular, and we can get into the differences between Monero and and Bitcoin in that sense, if, if you'd like. But but uh, obviously, ASIC ASIC mining is what happens with with Bitcoin, right? And so there there are some unique properties that are special in that sense. That's true, and then that in itself is an innovation. But Bitcoin has digital energy, or as as this you know potential energy that's being stored that you can then use later. I mean, that's just an analogy. And I think the problem is that I, that I have with it and, and other physicists who are Bitcoiners have with it is that Michael Saylor doesn't actually say it's an, an analogy. He uses it as if it's yeah. fact yeah. and he uses his engineering background to, yeah. to lend credibility to that. And I think that's really problematic. And I, I, I you know, I'm so glad you're saying it. Oh my God. it's just that, you know, there's so many people also in in. The Bitcoin space who believe Michael Saylor on this stuff. And then when you tell them, they get really upset. But it's just, that's just the fact. I mean, just, it's okay if you take it as an analogy, but know that it's an analogy. But on the other hand, Bitcoin isn't that us unique or like it's not like some gift from the gods either that humans can't really understand it and that's something that i i also have argued with people on twitter spaces about in the past it's like you know you can pretty much explain uh what bitcoin is and with the existing uh, science and mathematics that we have so why don't we just explain it through through that language because we already have that language and we and and also economics so for me i just like to demystify <laughs> bitcoin as much as possible because i i i worry with anything and it's not just bitcoin but i don't want people to become like overly religious about about something like that because when you get to that point you're not really curious about understanding the technicalities of it anymore and it's more like a worship thing or take it as fact kind of thing, you know, and and I think one of the important messages that come out of Bitcoin and, and other proof of work currencies is that this idea of, you know, don't trust verify. And if you start treating it as something as otherworldly, then you're not going to really verify it anymore. So. I just like to bring people back down to earth on this kind of stuff. Great, great, great point. <laughs> great. I mean, I mean, I think you basically described what the problem is with maximalism, Bitcoin maximalism in particular. I mean, I'm guilty perhaps of, of a little Monero maximalism myself, but the, the whole point in you need to maintain skepticism. This is this is a this is a project. This is a work work in progress. This is a science project. And yeah, uh, I think yeah. people have jumped too fast to concluding that, you know, uh, we've arrived at, at the final version already when we don't yet, you know, it's too soon. It's too soon to call. And I think Monero does a good job at staying skeptical as a community better than uh, what the Bitcoin community is doing right now. But yeah, about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think and Bitcoin has always been like this, but there's, 
a lot of influencers nowadays yeah. that are, are are pushing this and i think it's really just the dollar value of bitcoin at this point that attracts those kinds of people i mean i i think of myself as a bit of a bitcoin maximalist but i i have a a, a little special place for monero so i was excited to be here because i do appreciate a number of things that that are going on with monero and and have always taken it very seriously but uh yeah i think I think you don't, and I agree, like you don't really know what the future holds. You don't know, uh, you, you know, it's cryptocurrencies could be the thing that, you know, it could be that Bitcoin is like an ideal money under John Nash's treatise of ideal money, or it could be that it's not. I mean, we don't really know if this is like the ultimate end point in terms of money or if it's a stepping stone to something else. But in the meantime, I think it's great as a transition. So it we should put efforts in into it into the space. Totally, totally. How about um so you basically you kind of gave your viewpoint from how, how you see Bitcoin in, in light of physics and Monero. Uh, I mean we could get more into it, but how about like uh, from like an information theory standpoint, like the the fact that you know we have this this ledger or these ledgers that could effectively store information over time without corruption do you think that's something like a fundamental breakthrough or it's uh how, how would you I think, that? yeah i think it's an important breakthrough in terms of uh, being able to do it over a distributed network i don't you know we can do that in a centralized way and it's a lot easier i mean as soon as assuming that you trust the the person who's managing that database because it's really just a database at, at its basis that's just distributed over a number of nodes but but i think being able to do it in a distributed way in a decentralized way i do think that that is definitely an innovation that cannot be discounted i think that's significant and it does take it does take things in a different direction and in a very important direction because I think it's really important that we have the ability to have have this kind of level of transparency and accountability that doesn't necessarily re require putting trust in any one institution or any one individual. And how about from a communication standpoint? So in terms of communicating information, like it, I, I often maybe maybe I'm a little overzealous, but I often describe it as you know being the first way to communicate truly in a digital form without censorship. So peer-to-peer -peer people being able to send information to each other without that being stopped. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 did, uh, did crypto, is crypto achieving that? And what, what effect do you think that can potentially have? Yeah, I think that is, that is also a very, really significant innovation in that sense. Being able to transact without censorship is really important. It doesn't stop people from trying to censor you on these networks, of course. And there's and that's always something that you have to be vigilant about, especially when you're developing. And it's something that my friends and I, in, who are also Bitcoiners, who we talk a lot about this, is just the importance of privacy in, in, in development, in any of the tools that are being developed or protocols that are being developed on these layer one cryptocurrency networks like you really need to always keep that in mind because that's the fundamental aspect of or one of the fundamental aspects of these networks is to ensure privacy and and censorship resistance as much as possible and i think if we give that up in exchange for you know faster transactions or like more publicity or more number go up like if you give that up, then you're really losing everything that is actually special about these networks. And and in which case, you know, why not just use fiat? Yeah, totally, totally. So why not have a CBDC <laughs> if you're just going to give it up to get yeah, rich? We could get into that, too. So so where do you then see Bitcoin and Monero, um, you know, falling in that regard in terms of being censorship resistant money? Are they both doing effectively have the same value proposition and are trying to achieve the same thing? Are they both achieving the same thing? How, how do you see I think, thing? Yeah. So I think, you know, Monero is definitely, has definitely taken a path of being, 
of making privacy the number one priority and also uh, making it easier for users to have a, to, to be able to participate in the network. I think like, for example, the Monero wallet, the default Monero wallet has a built in ability to mine. Right. And I think that's pretty cool. And it's and I and what I like about it is it's sort of like an altruistic thing as well, because it's encouraging the users who are using the Monero GUI wallet to say, like, look, you can run this on your CPU. You may not ever, you know, mine a block, but you're securing the network. And that's really important. And I think that's something that should always be prioritized. I think, unfortunately, in Bitcoin, there is a little bit of a struggle because of the, the value of, the, of Bitcoin. Uh, where people are not uh, being as as altruistic as you know they're not altruistically mining as much as they could or should to maintain that hash rate uh, but on the other hand you know bitcoin i think the transparency of the network is really important as well especially if you want something that is more of like an institutional type money and i think that Bitcoin, in a way, is a little bit more of an institutional money than Monero is, and then that's okay. And it has it has layers above it, like the la layer two solutions, like Lightning, which make it make it more possible to use as a community money as well, and to do like short, you know faster transactions. And I think that's that's great. But I think ultimately, Bitcoin to me is more of an institutional money in that sense. But it's also, it is also, you know, it's it's also a lifeboat at the same time. And the value that it holds also makes it a little bit easier for you to access and to use as that lifeboat in comparison to, you know, fiat, right? So, so I think those things, those attributes balance it out. And I think that's, that's important. You know, Monero is not as well known, and I and I have some critiques over the mining, uh, the the pr type of proof of work algorithm that it uses compared to to that of, of Bitcoin's because I know I know the reason why it was chosen, but I think that uh, there's something that's being overlooked in there, but you know that's that's okay. I think go 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 into that more. So yeah, what's your critique of Random X? Yeah, so I know random X is is supposed to be ASEC resistant, and the idea is like, look, let's not let's oppose centralization of, mm -hmm. of mining, and that's that's fair. But I think that one of the problems with that is it's energy inefficient. So if you're mainly doing GPU, and it's so that's one problem. It's energy inefficient. If you wanted to maintain the same amount of value on Monero that you do on Bitcoin. You would need to use a lot more power to do that than if you were running ASICs. And if you think that Monero's value should be the same as Bitcoin, then you know, uh, imagine what the environmentalists will say about the energy consumption of Monero. It would be ridiculously high. Just look at a chart of the efficiency of of CPUs to GPUs down to ASICs, and you'll see it's massively different. And, and that's really important. That, that's really something that, that, that is really important to keep in mind. So you can't really maintain, I, I don't think that you can realistically maintain that same about, amount of value using RandomX just because of the amount of, of energy that you would need. I, I don't think that, uh, <laughs> that the, the, given the existing conditions that people would prove about of that. The other thing is that, that would, wait, hold on, we got we got to go to so, but that's I mean because Bitcoin basically has the, has the same exact problem, but you're saying it's an order of magnitude larger to the point where yeah it makes yeah it's not, it's energy like, efficiency. Monero is a, a waste of energy, but Bitcoin isn't. No, no, I'm not saying it's a waste of no, energy. I'm saying, I'm saying the, that uh, it's too that if you have the ability to reduce your energy consumption and maintain the strength and security of your network, you should. And ASICs, uh, they do do that. That is that is really their, their application purpose. So I think that that is, that is a, a problem. Aren't there... The other thing though, the other thing though, is that you're also competing with existing, uh, with other industries that use 
these general purpose chips. So you're existing uh, with everybody, you're competing with everybody else who needs CPU chips and everybody else who needs GPU chips. And that's a supply chain problem. And, and that is also, uh, I think, a really bad thing because you don't want to do that. You don't want to cause yourself, you don't want uh, people to have another reason to, to, to tear down your cryptocurrency. And I think that this is another reason to do that because you are competing in the same supply chain in which other all sorts of other uh, computations are done, like people using computers general for just general purpose, for example, like that's that's not I don't think that that's such a great idea to do. So I think it's much better to have a specialized chip. Now, in terms of centralization with ASICs, here's where I think that you can improve that. And that's by taking the most energy efficient chips, uh, uh, like the most energy efficient ASIC miner, and just chop that up into ninths or something like that, and then sell those to as a as a home mining industry. And now you pretty much anyone can mine in proportion to the amount of energy they're using, and they don't have to consume as much energy. And I think that that is a solution that even Monero can can work with, and you avoid all of that extra problem. Uh, and all that extra heat that you would get by basically, you know, creating too much demand in in a space uh, in a chip space that already is struggling to meet demand. So that's the, the that's why I'm not too worried about ASICs. And I but I do and I do appreciate uh, the, the 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 idea behind Monero's proof of work setup. Uh, but I, I I don't think it's I don't think it scales realistically in terms of the energy usage hmm. because yeah. of the energy efficiency of a cpu or a gpu versus an asic and okay. and i think realistically because of climate change and the fact that we do need that we are supposed to be making gains in terms of decarbonation decarbonization based off of energy efficiency that you also ultimately want to allow your proof of work to be able to utilize the most energy efficient chips as possible mm. So that's my argument. <laughs> there's, there's so much more to that, though, right? Because the, the end goal is decentralization, right? And this is just the means to decentralization. Uh, and, you know, Monero as a whole, because of the fact that it's, it's private, you can't see the ledger, uh, people can easily, you know, spin, spin up miners anywhere. It makes it very un unstoppable. Um, yeah, and so, that's great. You can get no. I'm saying you can reach that that unstoppable goal with less energy, uh, as opposed to Bitcoin that's relying on on ASICs and this idea that if you you know you need so many supercomputers to to reverse it. Yeah, well, but in reality, in reality, all you do you need to do is knock on the door of the five mining companies that own own the the miners and and that run the you know. Uh, you know the the systems and and you can influence them. So it's like you well, can't. You, that, go saying, ahead. These no, are go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Taken into account, right? That's the end goal is decentralization. I think though that this five companies that you're referring to, I assume, are like the five you know, like public companies. They only hold about like seventeen percent of the hash rate. So most of the network is private companies that are distributed across the the world. You guess so i don't think that's necessarily true general. but what i would say is like you should definitely do the math on that because yeah. i don't i don't think just just from my own back of the envelope type estimation i think that just one for one just on the energy efficiency alone if you if you held the same amount of value on monero today as you do on bitcoin you would need the same amount of security and in and, and in which case you would probably be using a lot more energy to maintain that kind of hash rate. So, yeah, yeah. I'm just I do, idea but, that achieving the end goal of decentralization. You know, yeah, of course. I mean, you, like I said, like I said about about chopping up these ASICs, that solves that problem. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, because you would be able to use the most energy efficient ASICs at home, but you don't need all of that ha hashing power, right? You're not necessarily trying to make a million dollars a month or anything, but you can make something that is within your price range uh, and your your electricity bill, and you're still securing the network. So I think that 
that that is, is useful in terms of decentralization. But I also think that decentralization with ASICs will continue to happen anyway because of how Bitcoin miners are integrating with the renewable energy sector and, and effectively with um, excess energy sources. And so as we see more of that happening, you will see a certain amount of decentralization in terms of location. And I think that that that's important as well. So like, there's trade-offs everywhere. And so I'm not here really to say, you know, Bitcoin yeah, will, yeah, yeah. Will, beat, will beat Monero, you know, because in fact, uh, what I'm saying is that there's trade-offs and, and Monero has made a trade-off and Bitcoin has made a trade-off. And what I see like with the tail emission for Monero, actually, the way I see it, because I like John Nash and I, and I like the stuff that he's written about ideal money and asymptotically ideal money, is that I see um, I actually see Monero as a much more commonplace cryptocurrency than, than Bitcoin in the long term because the tail emission is very similar to asymptotically ideal money, which is basically that it approaches zero, but it never actually hits a zero inflation, right? So you have this very slow, very low tail emission of, of new uh, of block rewards. Whereas with uh, Bitcoin, in 2140 or so we will there will be no more new bitcoin and even well before that we will hit a point of inflation that is so low that it is really tangential uh, to zero very quickly zero inflation until you know 2140 when it is effectively zero inflation and from uh, a, an ideal nash an ideal money perspective you know that is basically like 2140 it's ideal money which is now like a ruler stick for measuring the value of other currencies whereas monero with its tail emission is more similar to asymptotically ideal money which is more like that money that you would measure against the ruler stick i think so and that's something in my understanding of nash's writing is more like what you know a nation state would do with its own currency let's say like a euro to try to improve the goodness so i think in that way that's a little more you know that that adds uh, quite a, a, a different quality, I think, to to Monero uh, than than Bitcoin. So I really see them more like complementary currencies in that sense. But also just the the built-in privacy elements uh, into Monero, uh, you know, provide a different quality to it. So it's definitely something to be valued, absolutely, and and commendable. Yeah. Yeah. No, great, great points. Great points. And I want, I want to talk about, you know, like the fungibility, the fungibility aspect of Monero and how you see that, you know, perhaps making it uh, a better form of money. Uh, but I want to go back on some of the points that you're making. Just ASICs. So, yeah, totally uh, understand your criticism of it. And uh, I'm not trying to necessarily argue with you. I'm just trying to make sure you see all the the reasoning from a uh, Monero side, which it's, it's, you know, it's, it sounds like you do the, I guess the only other point would be, I think basically Bitcoin and Monero have the same objective. They're just taking different approaches towards it. And they're ultimately going to arrive at the same, uh, nearly the same point in terms of what the mining infrastructure is going to look like. Mm -hmm. It's just Bitcoin's trying to stall, um, you know, the inevitable, you know, basically give itself more time to allow technology to catch up. So, you know, the ASICs can be, you know, made cheap enough where everybody can have them. So rather than, you know, hope for it in the future, it's like, well, let's, let's just do it today. Everybody has a CPU, right? And then eventually, you know, the ASIC, the, 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 C, the ASIC of Monero is the CPU. And so um, it's, it's just a, a different approach, but ultimately kind of the same end where everybody's running this, this hardware in their homes, whether, you know, yeah, I know. I, I agree. I agree. I, but I, but you know, the the ability to mine with the ASIC has has done a lot in terms of changing the calculations in the energy sector, and in terms of decarbonization potentials, and and, and trying to deal with the revenue situation revenue losses or excess from excess energy because transmission hasn't really been built out yet and and if you really want to uh, overbuild and build fast 
you know, you need to be able to minimize some of those risks, those financial risks that investors have. And I always quote this, the UN, one of the UN reports said 80% of investment in renewable energy in the energy transition will come from the private sector. So you have to really balance out those risks. So while, yeah, while it's not so easy for you to mine with just regular cheap hardware with Bitcoin, on the other hand, it's providing uh, a lot of benefits to society because it chose to allow ASICs, because the community chose to go with ASICs and let that happen. So I think we have to recognize, like I said, that there are pluses and minuses. There's compromises. There's things that, based off the choices, you have certain repercussions that come about yeah. from that. And and I think that's okay, just so long as you recognize those and don't, instead of like, you know, saying like, one is necessarily better than the other, which I don't think is necessarily true. I think there's trade-offs, like I said, and I tried to highlight them, but just that they serve different purposes and they, and as a result, you have two different networks and two different currencies. Yep, yep, no, totally agree. Um, so yep, yeah, to the fungibility point then, do you have uh, an opinion there with regard? I, you know, you're making comments on Monero as money versus Bitcoin as money. The fact that it, you know, has an uh, basically the tail emission and it's disinflationary. Um, how about yeah, in terms of fungibility? Do you think there's a difference between the two? Crypto? Yeah, yeah, and I wanted to say one more thing about the the uh, Grand Max on Monero and the in the you know. Again, like saying, like, here are the benefits of going the ASIC route, and here's the benefits of the random X route. Mm -hmm. Because Monero is really a, a privacy first currency, I think the ability to to secure it with, with CPUs right now is great in terms of having a cur like a go to currency that you know that you can you can secure uh, with cheap hardware. So I think in terms of like on, if you're thinking like on a grassroots level of things, I think that's a really important decision to make. So I wanted to just throw out a, like that I do see some benefit. I wanted to highlight a, poten a potential benefit of choosing that route. Making it more uh, like accessible, you're saying more. Prepared. Yeah, yeah. And if you're if you're really trying to work under the radar, I think that you do want a currency that works in that way. But it does. But again, like you do, there is a trade off to that. Mm -hmm. So I. But it's a but it's it's an important choice to make in that sense because you're deciding that this is the route that you want this currency to go. Okay, so in terms of fungibility, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't I don't really have like an expertise take on this. I do know that we're Bitcoin has work still to do on this, and uh, more more so than than. Monero does just because of how the network works in Monero. But I am hoping, I'm hoping that, that this will be resolved. But it's a, you know, it's a, it's a critic. It's a, I think it's a valid criticism uh, for for Bitcoin in terms of fungibility. I think it it's something that needs to be prioritized more, and I'm hoping that it does get prioritized because ultimately, like. If you really want something that operates like cash, it has to be fungible, like truly fungible. So how do you balance that fungibility with transparency? I think that is that is something that has to be sorted out. Yeah. What do you see as you know some of the other things that stick out with you with regards to Monero as uh, you know maybe as you see as being having shortcomings versus versus Bitcoin. So like you ASICs versus CPUs, you see, I know, I know they're, well, or explain the other different design decisions, differences that you think are, are important to, to highlight between Bitcoin and Monero and where, you know, how you see them. would love to hear that. I don't, I really don't have too many. I mean, I first, I was, my first uh, interest I think was Monero over Bitcoin actually. So, there was a lot that I liked about Monero, and really, it's only since I've done spent a lot more time focused on Bitcoin's mining 
and energy usage that I've come up with these critiques about about the the way that the network is secured for Monero in terms of the growth and the direction of adoption of Monero compared to Bitcoin. But aside from that, I I really like Monero. I I used to I mean I I used to use Cakewall. I think that was one of my first wallets or was my first like true wallet and uh i had some problems with it so i don't really use it that more that much uh, anymore unfortunately awesome. yeah. <laughs> sorry <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's, it's working now but it, there was a couple of times where it didn't, <laughs> didn't quite work for me but the but the support they're, they're they respond quickly so i'll yeah, give them that it's their support small. team does respond very quickly and they're very friendly so i i mean yeah I was always I liked that I could have a Bitcoin and a Monero wallet in the same piece of software, so that that was really convenient for me. But yeah, you know, I le- there's really not too much of a critique I have for Monero. I know that the developer community has struggled a bit in the last couple of years, but you know, I think people's hearts in the right place, and I I love Seth for privacy. I, I love everything he does, and his uh, podcast is great his private podcast is great and um i think it's just really important to have a cryptocurrency that is decentralized and that cares about privacy very much and i actually think it's good that monero doesn't get that much attention because it allows it to to develop on its own and and figure itself out in even if it's in the shadow of bitcoin but that's okay i'm not a i'm not like a one currency person i always believe in having many options i think no maybe like the only thing that i wish would would be a little bit easier for people to get monero but uh that's that's okay that'll come i think but you know the central exchanges don't like monero but and then again you don't really want to be on the central exchange yeah, that, either. That, that, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 forcing people to to uh, act more peer to peer in Monero, right? Because there there aren't easily on ramps and off ramps. So, yeah, I think I think those I think those are benefits. I mean, so what you know, because you mentioned the ASIC thing, you know, maybe making it an issue, basically in in light of government and policy, right? So. What do you think of Monero with regards to regulation versus Bitcoin? Um, you know, this is really the ultimate question, right? So, like, do you they, they they may go after Monero more, right, for certain reasons? Maybe you agree or disagree. Um, and then, do you think Monero is potentially uh, more unstoppable than Bitcoin for certain reasons, or do you think? Bitcoin is more unstoppable because it's, you know, uh, not so threatening that governments will actually be okay with it existing. Like, does does Monero is 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 its um, nature uh, a a flaw or a benefit that it's you know uh, potentially attracting more regulation and can it fend it off? I think I don't necessarily think that one or the other is better at surviving regulation. I think even even if let's say all of the industrial mining companies are shut down, you can still go back to mining with CPUs and GPUs on Bitcoin. So it's not a really big deal. And at least we've already seen what happened with the hash rate dropping after the China ban, it recovered fairly quickly and predictably. So I think that's a really good sign that these type of distributed networks, these proof of work networks are resilient. And I think that that probably extends to Monero as well. So I don't think in that sense that either of them are are better at being resilient. But I think that Bitcoin right now has a lot more heat on it than Monero because the energy consumption is much higher and more traceable, I would say. So uh, that is uh, so that is the trade-off of, of being able to do ASIC mining, right? So you can do this industrial scale mining at this level. And and that has got, gotten a lot of bad press. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people don't understand the value of proof of work, why it's necessary over proof of stake, and, and that's problematic. 
so if you know if <laughs> if bitcoin goes down monero goes down in that sense too but only at the at a mass adoption scale i think you know you know it's like the early period of of peer to peer sharing of music in uh, on the internet it it forced it forced the music industry to provide high quality music and high quality video online and so that people would stop pirating music right and in the end people didn't stop pirating music but it just became not as popular you can still download music and movies and books for free uh, in the same way that you did then in the late 90s and early 2000s so and i think that if if cryptocurrencies had were banned and in, in this, that they would still go on and they would just be less mainstream they people would use them when they needed them so i think i think that that would actually push bitcoin to to take to to take a privacy route even more i believe if it were under those conditions because there's a lot of people who care about bitcoin and want to use it and would take would would have an even more incentive to build more privacy tools on that network as well so I think both are resilient and would survive just wouldn't be like all the speculation that you see now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It would probably be more of a money actually. Like they would both function way better as, as mediums of exchanges <laughs> actually, because you wouldn't have all that industry I mean, scale speculation. Right, right, right. I mean, the analogy with the music pirating would be that, you know, governments and corporations were forced to compete with crypto and essentially offer the value proposition that that crypto does to the degree where it becomes less significant right and they are and that would be like cbdc potentially if they could you know uh you know trick the people into thinking you know it has well i mean you could trust it more you know you can see it, uh, a mission a mission curve over time or you know who yeah. knows? it could potentially force governments to to try to compete in that way what is your take on that do you think that that's possible that governments can start to offer alternatives that you know move away from traditional fiat and towards crypto to the point where they can attract people for reasons that they would may use crypto in the first place i think so yeah i do i do think that there would be some people who will be attracted to that for reasons that i personally don't ascribe to like <laughs> i'm uh, not really interested in uh, in state money myself but i do think that there would be people who would just out of the convenience of it i'm i'm certain and and also i mean it's not i mean there are like really dystopian things that could happen you know with a cbdc there's certainly very dystopian things that could happen but on the other hand if you again like take the john nash game theory perspective it does force them to take the way that they print money more seriously and to be more cautious about it because you can measure that value against the yardstick that is Bitcoin. And so that's sort of what I mean about like ideal money. Like you need something to measure it against. And the fact that at some point Bitcoin is no longer, no longer has any inflation, right? There's no, no more currency being created. I think that makes it a pretty nice ruler in that sense. So it does force people force governments to take their money printing more seriously because it also reduces their control over the currency market i guess you could say because now people have an option they don't have to use your currency they could use another currency if they want to a stateless currency whether it's monero or bitcoin they can they have that option so now you don't have the same amount of power that you had before. And I think that the central banks realize that a lot of the messaging that's coming out of them seems to suggest that they are realizing that they are now in competition with cryptocurrencies or in particular Bitcoin at this point, just because of the adoption rate and, and also the fact that there, ha that there are countries now adopting Bitcoin. So I think that's a real threat 
to their bottom line and also just the fact that they've completely mismanaged the currency in the last uh, decade or so you know so yeah i think that it's very possible but again it could be very dystopian and and i'm hoping that that's not the case uh, and i'm hoping that that people will be smarter about about that but i'm not too sure <laughs> i don't have a lot of confidence <laughs> that people that there that people that most people would be aware enough of what they were getting themselves into when they open up that cbd that central bank account you know mm. I don't know. I'm an optimist in that regard. <laughs> I think people are going to find liberty. I hope so. I, mean, I really hope so. That That is my hope. But I just see like how easily people all have given up their privacy online mm -hmm. for convenience, yes. for free, for things that, you know, like free social media, free videos. But they're not really free because the corporation is running those platforms. They would only be free if it was truly peer to peer, you know. So, if it was that, so that's the that's what concerns me. Is like all those Facebook users, or you know, like the fact that we're tracked, all, you know, from one web page to another, and we have to do all these ad blockers just to try to try to stop that or use VPNs, and that these are all like extra steps. And most people don't have the time or the patience for all those extra steps. So I think that's that's why I see that it's very likely that you would see a large portion of the population adopt a CBDC. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think about this, think about this all the time, right? So you, the ultimate question is, how's it all going to play out? I mean, do you think crypto could be what, what prevents us from falling into a technological dystopia in terms of information control like <laughs> does it have the potential to, to save what feels like the inevitable i think it's the lifeboat right so you always have that escape through bitcoin or monero i don't really like any of the other ones so <laughs> i'm not gonna name them yeah uh, but bitcoin and monero i think are are lifeboats so i think even though we have, a, we could have, I mean, we already have a bit of a dystopian reality now, but an even more dystopian future, at least we would have these alternatives. So I think in that sense, we are better off, <laughs> but it won't be perfect, but it really, I think it really depends. There's just too many variables, I think there, that's hard to really say for sure. Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> it's a big one. I'm hoping, right? You're like, that's the hope. That's why we're here. That's why we're working on this stuff right, because right. we want to have that escape or that way to build something better, something less dystopian. But like so many things, it's a struggle, right? We got to believe. We got to believe. Yeah, and all you can do is just keep working at it yeah. no matter what, what the outcome is. Do you see, I mean, this is where I start to sound maybe like a Monero maxi, and, but there's a <laughs> lot of people in Monero that I think, you know, would agree with this point that Bitcoin's transparency essentially is an attack surface and it's, it makes it more susceptible to being controlled or co-opted co by, you know, companies or powerful governments. What's your, what's your take on that? I mean, it's possible. It, I think it's possible with uh, any any cryptocurrency. Really, I think there's always attack vectors that exist. And the public ledger, yeah, there. It's a pseudonymous ledger, so it's not truly anonymous. It's not true privacy. You can take steps to minimize it, but of course, it's not. It's not foolproof, and I think that a lot of people are concerned about that as well, who are also involved in Bitcoin. And there's lots of critiques around that as well within the space. So yeah, you really have to, I think, think about what you're doing with Bitcoin and, and what your end goal is, I think, like how, how you want to use this money and what's your expectation out of this money. I think that's an important question to raise. You know, like with layer two, uh, building new layers on top of 
the base layer of Bitcoin, I think that you can improve on the privacy. But on the base layer, yeah, I don't think that. As far as I know, like I don't think that you can really change too much in the in the layer one to improve that. But I but I also think that that's what makes it an institutional money because of that transparency. So that's why I'm I'm also a little hesitant to say that it shouldn't be there. I think that that transparency serves a purpose and it may not be a purpose that is useful right now, but it may be a very useful purpose should Bitcoin become an institutionalized money. Whereas with Monero, Monero is not going to be an institutionalized money because no institution is it's really going to adopt something where the people who use it are going to be you know totally private right that's just not how it's going to work but if you can use bitcoin so that you can improve institutional transparency i think that's a significant gain so you really have to question like you really have to think about what how, what are the real use cases of, the, of these money of these types of money and and what purpose do they serve and i think that as I sort of hinted before, is that I think that the Monero and Bitcoin serve two different purposes and are going down two different routes. And uh, that transparency aspect is part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, is, is Bitcoin the, the Trojan horse and that, that, ben, that Monero is, is riding in on? Is, what, do you, what do you think of that, uh, that meme? Oh, yeah, why not? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would like to see... Uh, I mean, I, you know, there's so much, and I've written a little bit about this, like the ability to build complementary currencies on the Bitcoin network. So I, I think that the ability to have many different types of currencies uh, is is part of the Trojan horse of Bitcoin, because you can you can build you can build off of that network, and you can also allow for other good cryptocurrencies to exist as well as a money. And Monero is just is one of those early one, early versions of a good cryptocurrency. I think, that, you know, it's not it's not it's not designed as a rug pull, and it's it's not a proof of stake. So, it's a uh, it's really has I think it has a lot of the same mission statement that Bitcoin does. And we we didn't even really talk about it. I mean, you're you're, you're kind of known for also for your you know your progressive leanings, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talked about that. You know, it, it your it it's progressivism aligns with the values of Bitcoin. Correct? Am I correct in saying? Yeah, I wrote it. I wrote an essay in or article for Bitcoin Magazine last year. That's I think they called it progressivism and Bitcoin aren't opposed, mm -hmm. and it was. It, really, so it was a response to an article by Daniel Kuhn. I think, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name, or Kuhn, maybe K-U-H-N. And Kuhn, I don't know. But that's how he spelled last name. And uh, he wrote an article, I think, in, for Coindesk or something that was just like, oh, yeah, you know, cryptocurrencies aren't, don't don't work with progressivism. And, and I just like kind of like did a rant in a private chat uh, about that. And then my friend, and my friends were like, oh, you should write something. <laughs> you should just write all of that into an article. So that's that's what ended up being that 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 article, which is just showing the overlaps with the political philosophy behind progressives and and trying to tie that back into deeper into the early movements on the left, which was really both they were really anarchist movements and that were anti capitalist. And trying to show that you know there is this decentralized element uh, on that side of the spectrum of politics that exists and is still there, uh, but you know it's not as much out in the open and it's generally misunderstood. But it's there and that's part of the history of progressives. And I and just tried to remind people or to remind progressives of you know what what the Occupy movement meant and how that overlaps with Bitcoin as well. So I do think that you know, Bitcoin is, is a pretty universal money um, and that anyone can benefit from it, especially progressives. And I, I'm hoping 
that through education, progressives will come around. But, you know, a lot of people are still, I mean, there are plenty of progressives in space, but, you know, they're not as popular as other uh, political leanings. And uh, apparently that's because of a misunderstanding of the energy usage and also because of the speculation. And they just associate that with Wall Street. And that's a real, really big barrier. How about the, the digital cash aspect? There, there's, there, there, there's no, are there arguments, uh, progressive arguments against true digital cash? No, right? I mean. No, in fact, in fact, there was a post Keynesian aligned uh, politician who had some legislation in Congress that was e-cash and e-cash legislation that was meant to maintain the fungibility that exists in the dollar and like the actual cash of version of the dollar. But I think my understanding is that it was really not, not really aligned with our general values in terms of like having a, a capped money supply and, and uh, a little, I guess some other th issues around that. So they're not really opposed to an e-cash. And I know that some of them will like, some people will mention like other cryptocurrencies and then I have to explain to them like your know, proof of stake is is bad for these reasons. You're just replicating the existing financial system. So they're not really opposed to the idea. They just think that it's only good for speculation, which is unfortunate because there's a lot of good stuff happening, especially with the Lightning Network and the adoption that's happening in other parts of the world and the use cases in terms of trying to avoid a, you're, you know, trying to maintain a certain amount of value of your, your hard, your earnings um, under hyperinflation. So Bitcoin has done a lot of really good things in that sense. And I'm sure Monero has played a certain, a certain role in that as well. So, but, but unfortunately, it's really hard to, to get them, to get other progressives to see that, that narrative. You think that's? I mean, that's going to come to fruition. Do you see? Do you see a trend potentially uh, going on there, or is it it's going to take some time? I don't see. I don't see anybody on the uh, amongst progressives really uh, giving in to Bitcoin or Monero right now. So I don't. I can't say that there's a trend, um, <laughs> but there definitely are people who, for example, were big Bernie supporters and are really in really involved in Bitcoin. So. They're there, or we're there, but we're just not as well known in the space. Most people have kept quiet, and or they've also been interested in, in other things that are happening on Ethereum and stuff. So they're maybe not so much you know, Bitcoin maximalists, but they like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but I think that well, I will say that I think that there is a narrative shift happening in in Bitcoin in terms of content creation. We're starting to see a lot more type progressive type voices uh, coming out and doing creating their own podcasts and now there's somebody who's writing a book for progressives about bitcoin which is really cool so i think we will see more of that in, in the future and maybe that and ho hopefully that will lead to better education uh, of progressives or people who hold those values so that's my hope but i know like amongst my my own friends that it's pretty challenging to get them to uh, be interested or in Bitcoin or really hear me out on it. They'll let me talk about the energy transition, but they won't let me talk about Bitcoin. <laughs> so they don't want to hear any of the good, just the bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate because all of the, you know, all these articles that we call them FUD, right? Like that they've really created a narrative that, plays on people's emotions very strongly. So people have a real visceral reaction to the mention of Bitcoin because mm -hmm. they think it's literally boiling the planet or melting the planet, even though there's no evidence of that. Right. And, and, and some of these stories, even like around like uh, Greenwich in upstate New York, which is a natural gas plant that started mining Bitcoin in 2020, even, even those narratives get distorted and they, and they, they get pushed into into these extremes, which which is not really what's happening there. But people, and and it's not just the readers; it's like the actual reporting is wrong or misleading, and and I think that's 
that's really unfortunate and, and part of the problem. And it's doing a lot of damage to the adoption of Bitcoin right now. What else, what else do you think could be done to help get out the word about the importance of digital cash, that use case, you know, that, that crypto is trying to fulfill? What, what do you think could be done with regards to getting people excited about that and realizing that's like something fundamental that, that you're going to want to have if you want a free and open society in, in the future? What, what can hmm. be done to... Well, I think probably just have to keep generating content that's interesting. I'm not, I think it's really important not uh, to have more content around uh, cryptocurrencies like Monero and Bitcoin that aren't just about number go up or like how to trade or invest or to just hodl because I think that that really takes away from the most important elements uh, of these currencies, which is really medium of exchange more than anything. And if you really want adoption, you need medium of exchange. You really need people to use it and to make and to, to earn it and, you know, and to get that currency through the process of exchange and the process of being paid in that currency. And so it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem between the speculation and, and the use, actual everyday use case of buying and selling things with it and being paid in it and paying other people in that currency. Because on the one hand, whenever you have these bull runs, you get tons of people who get really excited and then they start learning about the currencies and they make all sorts of mistakes and then eventually they make their way to something like Bitcoin or Monero and they're like, oh, okay, this is the real deal. But, uh, but that that speculation also creates a lot of volatility so then it makes it harder to use it as medium of exchange so at some point there needs to be a shift from the speculation into like really using this as a medium of exchange so so i would love to see more content that was less focused on the speculation less focused on hodling and more focused on the use cases and and what is really happening with these currencies like um you know like how are they being used to to help people who are who are trying to resist authoritarian governments you know or like who are doing who are protesting and they're trying to maintain their privacy you know things like that i think are the are the things that need to be highlighted the most and and stories like that are what re will reach progressives or more left-minded people because they're usually the ones protesting uh, you know so uh, i think that's really important i we need to see more content around that so i'm hoping i'm hoping maybe during this bear market we might start to see more of that come out mm -hmm. because people are because it seems that uh you know the price right now is, it has tanked which is i think not a bad thing so yeah i think it's i think that's what needs to happen just generate more meaningful content less less shiny stuff mm -hmm. totally totally do you think we'll start to see you know uh, characters like alex gladstein talking about you know why people might want to use monero for those purposes i, I see that I, I'm trying to understand why we're not seeing more of that, you know, like, uh, I think he like I, an opportunity to, to, to help this technology. Yeah. I think he may not be talking about it because he hasn't heard any stories about it because he was actually really skeptical about stable coins for good reasons. Mm -hmm. And he had to come around on them because the, the people were telling him, you know, we're also using those too. We're using those as part of our resistance, as part of our way to to manage this the situation that we're in. So there, so I think he's just reporting what he's being told. So if there are like really resistant use cases that where Monero is becoming prominent, I'm certain that he would he would talk about them because he did start talking about stable coins, and that was that that was something new in the last year, and he actually. I think the Human Rights Foundation had a bounty, a one Bitcoin bounty to get stable coins on Lightning Network, which Lightning, Lightning Labs has managed to do with their Taro protocol, which is still being tested. But um, I think he realized that that volatility thing is is something that is, is, is important as much as we like to try to ignore it. It, does, it is important. 
So, yeah, I think if he hears more about Monero from the human rights community, I'm sure that he would he would start talking about it. I, I had him on the show years ago. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if his opinion has changed since then. I, I would hope so. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I'm surprised I haven't heard him talking about it more at this point. Um, what do you? Oh, what do you think? Like, so that I mean, that's kind of a similar discussion. Like, so the fact that we're seeing Monero used on the dark markets, we're seeing it being used for ransomware. So it's showing adoption for digital cash purposes. Um, you know, using it to fund political dissidents. You know, that's other examples of where you know we'd love you'd love to see adoption there, right? Those those are very positive use cases. Uh, but it's we're seeing adoption for these arguably nefarious use cases. I personally, you know, I like to call them you know just open markets, not not dark markets. I think there's a lot of uh, negative terminology that's used. But what's your opinion there? Um, is that significant? I mean, that's good. It's good to see that Monero is being used as a currency. I'm not opposed to black or gray markets either. I think they serve a, a purpose. You know, the Silk Road was really important. So I oppose that. Free Ross, you know, I'm, I'm all for freeing Ross. I think I think that was a real trap, a real injustice that was done there. So I think it's, I think all that's a positive from my perspective, anyway, from the government's perspective, that's not a positive. <laughs> so it really depends on what you value around that. I think it's great. <laughs> progressive, what do you think the progressive opinion would be on, on something like that? Oh, yeah, it depends. You know, the people, it, you know, it's like the, with the internet early on, people, it was, the, it was the four four horsemen of the infoocalypse. You know, they said, oh, the internet's only used for for money laundering, <laughs> um, pornography, I don't know, crim, crimes, I don't know, something else. I forget what the other one was. You know, so it's sort of the same narrative. And a lot of people just jump at that. They're like, oh, that's bad. You know, those things, I don't like those things. So I definitely don't like that thing that's making that thing that I don't like easier. So, so there's certainly, or there certainly are people who are progressives who would, who would be like, oh, you know, that's only good for money laundering, you know. When of course the banking system is just the number one money launder, <laughs> you know, HSBC money laundering for car drug cartels. And I used to have a credit card with them, and anytime I would talk to talk to one of the representatives, I would tell them like, do you know that HSBC did this, this, and this, and this? <laughs> And it, and uh, I don't, they never knew what to say, but I would I would tell them because I absolutely despised that that bank for yeah. everything that they did, and so it's just like people are just so they just have no idea what's going on and they're just buying into these narratives. So yeah, I I think right now a lot of them a lot of people say like oh that's really bad, you know that it's being used in these ways. They don't really see that actually because it enables certain other things that maybe are not as pretty to think about it also means that you have the same ability to use that money in that way when you need it when you're in trouble or when the government is after you which which happens you know with government surveillance of of any type of dissident and and progressives are are not uh, are not immune to to that type of surveillance and it has happened a lot at at protests and demonstrations and, and in organizations that are working for various issues that the government is not willing to to budge on. So, you know, I think that they don't they, they don't realize that what it means for them at the same time. So it's just an education thing. What do you see as being a potential catalyst you know, for the adoption of crypto would it be something like you know the advent of cbdc's like what could potentially be the catalyst that takes you know humanity to the next level in terms of crypto adoption well i work a lot on climate change and i'm i have seen a complete inaction from governments and an inability from people to change or to demand better of their governments 
So I sort of, I'm sort of more cynical than most people, I think, because of my position and the work that I do. So I tend to think that what, what it will take is a real systemic shock, like a real crisis, a real economic crisis, or a real climate crisis, you know, and not to say that we're not in a climate crisis, but you know, like a real, really bad situation where we have waited too long, even longer than we have already to take action. And we have serious, serious repercussions as a result that, that threaten our very livelihood on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that it would take something of that scale as well, some type of economic shock where let's say the dollar hyperinflates and people are like, oh my gosh, what do I do now? And then they're like, oh, hey, by the way, we've been here. <laughs> Here's what you can do. You know, I think that it's something like that. I think so long as people are comfortable, they're not really going to to do adoption at the scale that people expect. You know, this like idea of hyper Bitcoinization. I don't think it's going to happen without some kind of serious economic shock, which is not really great either, because it means that there will be a lot of hardship and suffering that will come along with that. You don't really want that, but you know, I think that those that's sort of where our society is right now, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. What would you, yeah, this is, this is a tough question. I've been asking a lot of tough questions. What if, <laughs> you know, if we, we started to really be, you know, something like Monero used by political dissidents, but of, of parties and movements that really oppose what you, you know, ethically believe in or, you know, that oppose the progressive viewpoints uh, but at the same time, it's it's proving, uh, you know, value and in, in, in being useful as censorship resistant money. What, what, how would you personally react to that? And what do you think the, you know, general reaction may be among different political groups? Well, I mean, like, like we say, Bitcoin is for anyone or Bitcoin is for enemies. So I really believe in a neutral protocol, a neutral money that anybody can use. And, and so I don't really, I, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be that happy, you know, but I, it, it ensures that I can still use it. And that's the most important thing. Awesome. I think, I think that's the hardest thing for, for people to accept though, right? Or one of the, one of the hardest things. Um, and that's difficult. Yeah, it is. It is. I've had conversations like that with with someone who's a progressive and fairly important in that space. And, and he has asked me something similar and I, and I explained it to him and I, basically like, I'm telling you, like, it's a neutral protocol. It's like, you know, it's like a telephone. Anybody can use a telephone. Anybody can use dollars. Anybody can use cash. Nazis can use cash. Nazis can use the, the telephone. I mean, it's the same thing. Nobody's saying don't let Nazis use the telephone. <laughs> You know, don't let Nazis use the public bathroom. I don't know. You know, it's just there's just some things that have to be universal in order to maintain a universal right. So it, it it's not it's it's hard to accept, but I think that in order to have an open society, you have to accept that about certain things. Certain things have to be universal. Do you think we'll see that debate on a high? political level in, in this country, in the United States? Hmm. <laughs> uh, I know where you are. But in the United States. Yeah, in the US. I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's in the interest of, of the state to have that conversation, personally. I think states are generally about having people give up a certain amount of rights and protection to the state in exchange for something. Right, like protection or security. And I don't think that uh, that they would want to give you that much freedom. No, I'm saying they would try to potentially ban it for those reasons. Do you think? Oh, that, yeah. Know, and then there's this, debate, yeah. uh, you know, among electeds as to whether or not philosophically, you know, yeah, of course, the values of America, right? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, of course, even now, just like. I've seen counter arguments for cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin in particular because Putin used it apparently, or Putin's ol oligarchs used it to hide their money from sanctions. And so that's used as a reason why we shouldn't have Bitcoin. 
I see those arguments now. They would, if Bitcoin became more prominent, absolutely, those arguments would become even more, more even louder, mm-hmm. because people don't. They pe- people in power want to, the ability to choose who gets to do what, and that that's something they don't want to lose. So yeah, I would, I would definitely see that as as another reason, and even down the line, if for some reason Bitcoin becomes even bigger, that certainly would be a, another mainstream argument against against adoption. Where do you stand with regards to uh, you know what role you think the state should play in society? Well, I'm I'm more of an anarchist than anything else, so I'm not really a, a, a fan of the state. I, I'm I'm more about decentralizing power, and I, I I believe that people should that we should have a bottom up democracy, not a representative democracy. I'm not really a fan of liberal democracy at this point, and I would like to see communities have more power to govern themselves. And, and from there to have like federations in which that in which they can come together and, and make decisions. So I'm not really a, a big fan of the state, but I'm, that doesn't mean that I'm opposed to rules. And I think that any any type of bottom up governance structure would have rules and um, the people would decide those rules. And, and that's OK. That's OK with me. So. That's that's mostly how I how I feel about state power. I guess I don't really, I just don't really like centralized control, centralized power. I think it's too dangerous. All right, <laughs> we definitely agree on that. I think we we uh, we agree on a lot, and uh, I, you know I really appreciate your your points, the things you're bringing up. Uh, I appreciate um, your understanding of these topics. We got a lot of great information out there. This was great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on your show. It was a lot of fun. Actually, we talked about things that I don't normally get asked about on podcasts. I, ho- I hope I didn't annoy you. I, I could come across very annoying with my Monero. Uh, I wasn't trying to, you know, shove Monero down your throat, but, you know, just making sure you know what the arguments are in this end. But... No, no. I Like I said, I really like Monero. And I mean, for, for a while, I was way more into Monero than Bitcoin. So I'm totally... I'm totally fine with that. I like, I like what Monero has to offer. I, like I said, I think it's complementary, and I and it's good to have a currency that is very privacy centric. And I think it, it actually puts good pressure on and good critique on on Bitcoin too. So it's really important to have something like that available. And Seth uh, does such a great job of of giving just really good uh, critiques and. And really fair critiques too, and 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 a lot of people are coming around in the Bitcoin space and 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 are showing a lot of respect to those critiques and taking them seriously. So I think it's great. Yes, yeah, Seth is the great diplomat of Monero for sure. Yeah, definitely. He does a much better job than me at that. <laughs> I serve another purpose. Not sure what it is, but um, we actually had Seth and Giacomo on. We just did a Monero talk. I don't know if you, it was actually, oh, cool. I recommend watching it actually. We did it. Oh, it cool. Yeah. Part. Yeah. And we really go into, you know, a Bitcoin versus yeah. Monero. Giacomo just, you know, lifts it all out there and we cover all the points. It was fun. Awesome. Um, cool. Mario, anything else you want to bring up before we close it out? Uh, no, uh, no, I can hear my dog going crazy and okay. I, and I, and I, I, I don't know if that's really annoying for you, but I, I'm just worried that it is because <laughs> I, I can't. I don't know why she wants. I think it's going to be annoying for the listeners, but <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry. Usually, uh, she's not like. Well, I mean, she barks a lot, but she. This is a little bit much today. I don't. I don't know what's going on out there right now. <laughs> outside right, my door. Sorry, you had to deal with that stress. I apologize for. Uh, yeah, sorry. So noisy on this end today, but hopefully people could hear us speak over the, the sounds in the background. <laughs> They'll deal with it. It's such good convo. They'll they'll listen in. They'll you know rewind and play again. Yeah. Um, where where can people learn more about you? Follow you? Uh, read your writings? Okay. Yeah. So I'm on Twitter, Jin Urso, J Y N underscore U R S O, 
and that's named after the main character from Rogue One. So if you forget, just look her up and just change the E in her last name to a U. That's me, Jen Urso. And I also have writing a lot of writing on medium.com under a pseudonym called Magnus Paravalon. And there's a long story or sort of short story around why I have a pseudonym <laughs> for, uh, or a pen name. But you can get to all of my writings uh, from my Twitter account. I have a, a link tree link in my profile. So if you just find me on Twitter, you're, you'll find everything else that I do because that really is my, my uh, way that I interact with Bitcoin and, and other people, other communities in the cryptocurrency space is through Twitter. So that's the best way to find me. You should put, I don't know if you have, because I, I don't think you did. You should have a link to all the videos that you were like interviewed on. Oh yeah, I need to, I, I need to update that. Peter McCormick's thing until like an hour before this show. I was like, oh no, and I watched it. I like, listened to it on 3X. So like, oh my oh God. wow, yeah, that was a long, it was two hours. <laughs> and yeah, I need to update that. You're right. I haven't, yeah, have not added. And here. I've been on a lot of podcasts yeah. since I have to keep track. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, um, yeah, I'll I'll figure out how to get all those on there. That's that's a good point. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Cool. For- awesome. And oh, and also, I'm I'm also a fellow at the Bitcoin Policy Institute, so I have some more technical writings on there as well, including uh, one a, a policy brief that I wrote for the institute recently about Greenwich in New York, which is really long, it's 10 pages, but if you're interested in the background story on that natural gas plant and how they came to mine Bitcoin and, and all the controversy surrounding it, you can read like the first couple of pages and you'll get the gist of that there. I feel like we should cover that. We could save that for, for another show. Yeah, if you want to talk about it on, uh, another time, it's pretty yeah. interesting, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. I've, I've, I'm New York based and uh, I've done some shows on it. Uh, yeah, we definitely love to talk to you more about that in the future for sure. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, Doug. All right. Bless. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> All right. Take care. Ciao. Thank you. Okay, bye. bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.